Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the third edition of uh, the RSL and Services Clubs Association's digital program, Evolve, brought to you by Max. We welcome all uh, participants from clubs and venues across New South Wales, and we also have a couple of people registered from uh, other states. So welcome to everyone. Today's session is on bar and beverage service requirements. And we will have uh, presenters for Julian Black from Lion Beers, Warwick Brook from Debortley Wines, Craig Weeks from Coca-Cola Amatil, and Carl Pavitt from Hunter Technologies or Seller Control as their brand is called. Uh, I will be introducing each of those presenters to you. If you remember, if you've not participated before, at the bottom of your screen, there is a little box called Q&A. If, if during the presentation you have a question that you wish to raise, please type the question you have on the Q&A box and I will see it and will then, at the end of each presentation, will ask the presenter that question. We'll also have some time at the end of the presentation, probably five or 10 minutes, for any further questions. And also I will provide you with the contact details of each of our presenters today, so that if you wish to follow up with any of those presenters and, and seek some more clarification, you will have their email addresses and mobile phone numbers to uh, contact them. So now I will take off my slides and invite our first presenter, Julian Black from Lion Beers, to load his slides and to do his section of the presentation. Welcome to you, Julian. Thank you, Gary. Just while I load this up. Have you all got me? Yes. Excellent, thanks, Gary. So hi, everyone. Thank you for attending today's session. It's been a crazy few months in the hospitality world, and it's certainly changed over the last few months and likely will continue to be somewhat different moving forward. So a little bit of background on myself. My name, as Gary introduced, my name is Julian Black. I'm Group Accounts Manager for Lion. I've been in the industry for 15 years and I've been with Lion for the last eight years and I have head up our on-premise key account team across New South Wales. We manage in my team 65 hotel and club groups that spans across 400 venues. So today, today's menu, I'm gonna to cover three topics that will spread across two broad themes. The first one is the changing landscape of liquor and in particular, the context of how beer operates within liquor. Um, and two dynamics of the post COVID behavior and maximizing people in your venue. The second topic is how to succeed in the new environment. The levers that you can pull and how to pull them to make the most out of beer. And that's through right portfolio, the right price, right place and promotion to ensure that we're really capitalizing on people in venues at the moment. So next up, I'm just gonna show you a quick slide. I'm not gonna go into it too, into too much detail as you most, most of you I'm sure have already um, restarted your beer system. Um, so there are 10 easy steps to restarting your beer system. So if you do need these um, points, please reach out to either your line sales executive. Um, you can get the information or my details from Gary post his call. Um, but, and there also is a really great YouTube video that step-by-step um, -step spells out exactly what you need to do to set up your um, and restart your, your beer system. So um, don't hesitate to reach out if you do need support um, in that area. And we've got a great um, draft quality people available to you um, if, you, if you so need. Okay, so what are some of the differences um, post COVID? So with the current restrictions still impacting how we operate, there's some insights that we've been able to gather from a sample size of 983 people from the ages of 18 to 65. So some of those insights are that 57% of people said that it would take them a while to feel comfortable visiting hotels and clubs again. 
and the majority of these people saying they wouldn't revisit on-premise for one to six months. Keeping in mind, you know, the people that we did sample, a lot of them might not have even gone into venues previously. So there's some stats there that are, you know, pretty alarming and making sure that we are capitalising when people are in venue that you're going to give them everything they need so that they will revisit. 36% of consumers are not happy to wait in a queue or at a hotel or club during the restrictions. Bar queues, as we know, will take four to five times their normal um, space um, due to the 1.5 metre distancing. And most bars are not set up to support a 12 metre queue for just five patrons. So from these insights, we've, we've gathered some opportunities. Um, so they are that whilst you, you have your consumers in the venue, you really need to do the basics well. So by basics, I mean service, cleaning, communication, value and offering. To really capitalise them being in the venue, you need to make the most of it. Speed of service and trading customers up from lower GP or lower margin brands to higher margin brands is also going to be important for your revenue and your profit. Um, and we recommend that serving in a larger format such as jugs will help on both of those fronts. Some of the benefits of jugs, they increase your basket size and your revenue, um, but you really need your staff trained up to ensure that they are thinking about that when they have a customer in front of them and they're serving someone to have upselling in the back of their mind um, or in the, in the forefront really of their mind. Maximising the spend per visit is going to be huge and to do that you need to trade consumers up from the, um, the lower margin brands to higher margin brands. So as I mentioned, staff training is super important. Um, every time a, con a consumer comes to the bar, we need to encourage that trade up either from a schooner to a pint or a pint to a jug. Um, so what that would look like in reality would be like if a customer comes up and asks for a two is new, how about a, a 150 lashes sir or ma'am? So there's three ways that we can maximise this opportunity. So that's through more patrons, delivering more revenue and more profit. So the first is to create comfort in your venue. And you do that by ensuring that you're following all these um, different steps, like the physical distancing signs, making sure that you've got the sanitizer ready and available at all points. You've got the dis um, you've got displays in your bathrooms clearly showing that the hygiene processes that your staff are following. Um, the next one is more revenue, so lifting your speed of service. So my recommendation for that is to um, look at jugs as it will also help um, harness efficient formats so people don't have to come up and queue up as much and there's also less hands on glassware. And then the final one is driving that trade up. So um, ensuring that you're leveraging your staff and communications to sell more premium products. Staff training is going to be massive. An, op an opportunity or, or an idea could be to have a trade up champion in your venue so staff members can check in um, with each other and make, make sure that they are actually um, encouraging people to trade up and getting praise when they do so. So this could be re rewarded for individuals or teams. Um, if they do so, have um, good outcomes in that space. Here's an example of a margin roadmap um, and a tool that will help customers to pick the best brand to focus on when they are looking to trade up. So in this example, looking at the left-hand side first, you, ed you need to understand your split of beer sales. So finding the biggest selling tap beer, in this example, it's a New South Wales Metro RSL. So two is new, makes up 50% of the total volume of this venue. Um, Furphy Enhanced Superdrive would be the next best fit. You can see in the green there, highlighting the Furphy and the Hard Superdrive. Um, they have the next highest amount of volume. So they also deliver 7% higher profit than they do, than two is new does. So in this example, the best trade up brand would be one of those two brands. Um, and a good way to get this across and try to uh, cement some extra revenue and margin by doing this is looking to do a staff incentive. So your staff have an incentive to trade up to Super Dry or Furphy, which will deliver you a 7% extra GP every serve. Line have uh, kits available to help you comply with the new physical distancing restrictions and rules. Um, we have 
floor decals showing people where to stand in high traffic zones. We have reminder bar mats to cement the rules. We've got barriers to direct traffic and ensure people know where to stand and where to queue. We have posters that clearly give, in, give instructions on hand washing technique in the bathrooms, prompts you to pay by credit card and also physical distancing signs that have absolute clarity on where you shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't be standing. Um, if you require these, please let Gary or myself know. Um, we do have some available for partner customers via promotional funds, um, but they can also be ordered separately. Um, so if you do need them, please just um, make a note and reach out um, as we do, um, do have them available for customers who range our brand. On top of that, we've also got um, some extra tools. So the jugs, branded jugs, both in the um, 1140 mil, um, which is the standard jug size, as well as the mega jug 1.7 litre um, in those five brands there. Um, so the benefits of jugs, it improves your speed of service, it lifts patron spend, it extends um, patrons occasions, and it's and it, and at, a, at appealing a price point, um, will also deliver you um, great margin and engage more patrons because they will be looking um, for value at the moment. So what we know from retail and the off-premise sales over the last few months is that the big brands like your two inch new and your Forex goals, um, especially in that bigger size, so a 30 cam block, that saw the biggest increase in sales throughout the last three months. So people are looking for a bit more value. Um, if they've got a hundred bucks to spend, they want to get more value for their money um, when they are out and potentially not visiting venues as much. So we expect to see similar trends in the on-premise over these next couple of months of, um, of trade. We've also got those high quality communication tools such as permanent tap talkers, um, which really highlight exactly what you have available on promotion. Um, and these tools, you know, you don't even need to have it on promotion or a lower price point because people shop um, when they see a tap decal or a tap talker on like that, they automatically think it's a promotion, even though it might not be actually a, um, a, a cheaper price point. So I've gone just on 10 minutes there, Gary. So that is the end of my presentation. So hopefully that's, um, yeah, there's some good insights there and yeah, good luck to you all over the next few months as we come through the other end of this uh, mm -hmm. COVID-19. Excellent, thank you very much, Julian. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. And as I indicated before, at the end of the session today, I'll have everyone's contact details, their email address and their mobile phone number. So if you wish to take up Julian's offer of, uh, of securing some of those decals or, or any of the products that uh, Julian's outlined, please either communicate directly with Julian or you can email me and I can put you in contact with Julian. All right, our next presenter is our good friend Warwick Brook from De Bortoli Wines. And many of you will know that De Bortoli has been uh, our partner, our wine partner for the association for many years, and we've appreciated their great support. So I'm delighted to have Warwick here. Uh, and uh, Warwick, if you want to load up your slides now, um, and uh, Warwick will talk about wine products and services. Thank you, Warwick. Okay, have you got me there, Gary? Yes, all good. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, good afternoon, everyone. As Gary said, my name's Warwick Brook from De Bortley Wines, and I'm delighted to be on this webinar this afternoon. As Gary mentioned, we've been part of the association for many years, so there's probably a lot of people out there that I do know. For those that I don't know at the moment, um, I certainly look forward to meeting you in face-to-face -face when we get to back to some sort of normality. What I'd like to do this afternoon is uh, just take you through some, um, some market data just on sparkling white wines and red wines and some of the products that we have produced because of this data. As you know, data is particularly important for working out what's happening with trends and what our consumers are wanting to purchase. So I'll take you through that. I'll give you some single serve options, uh, which are more prevalent now than ever. Uh, On-premise only brands, which is all about uh, margin, 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 which we all obviously need at the moment, and then some POS options as well. Okay, let's have a look at um, 
some sparkling wine data. So probably the, uh, the columns to look at here is everything down the left hand side. So that just goes to show you what the different, when you talk about sparkling wines, what are the different styles within that. There's actually champagne, there's uh, cuvee, prosecco, rosé, so on and so forth. The column next to that just goes to show what uh, the percentage share of the uh, category that particular brand is or that particular style is. And then two over from that where, the start, where there's a start of all these uh, red and green arrows indicates whether that is actually in growth or not in growth. So if you have a look at that, uh, the second uh, row down there, you'll see it says champagne white. So that's an indication that at the moment, champagne within our market, within the Australian market, represents 23.8% of the category, which is absolutely enormous. Yes, there is absolutely lots of champagne houses out there. But for the country that we are, the size of our population, we are the seventh biggest importer of champagne around the world, which is absolutely amazing, which equates to about $8 million annually. So when you compare the biggest markets being UK and the United States, when you actually have a look at their actual size of their populations, we over-index enormously, God love us. So uh, nothing like a champagne. It, um, Every time someone mentions champagne to me, it reminds me of my father who gave me my first advice when I was going out on my very first date. He said, remember Warwick, he loved his champagne. He said, remember champagne, most of the girls dance and drop their pants. So when anyone mentions champagne to me, it's something that takes me back to my 19th birthday. So, um, but anyway, let's have a look at some of those highlighted um, categories here, Prosecco. You'll see it's representing about 14.1% of the category growing at 192 that is enormous growth for something that's representing 14.1% of the category. And then sparkling rosé as well, which is 8.6%. And it is also growing at about 10.5%. So these are very, very big categories that are growing at the moment in styles. Um, I'll just go back here. Sorry, just jumped ahead one. Okay, Prosecco, obviously, so how can, we, how can we help you guys at the moment? As I said, the Prosecco growing and growing at about 19.2%. Our Prosecco, which is the King Valley Prosecco, is growing at about 36% year on year and is now actually the, the third biggest selling Prosecco in the market. As you can see down there, yes, it's, it's got a fair bit of bling. So the, the people out there, the, the wine writers, the, uh, the people in the know, the ones that judge the wine, think it's pretty good as well. So uh, with a couple of gold medals and some silver medals and some bronze medals. So this is a category, if you don't have this on your list, if you don't have Proseccos on your list at the moment, your consumers, your members are looking for it. Interestingly enough, it will be funny to see what happens in the future with Prosecco because the Italians are actually wanting to make this a GI, in other words, a geographical indication. As you know, anything that's made in Champagne can be called Champagne. And that's why a few years ago we moved away from calling it Champagne because it was illegal. The Italians are wanting to do the same thing here too. So it'll be interesting over the next few years if the European Union gets it through obviously Australia will need to, to find a new name for Prosecco. So it's a, a little bit of a, a watch this space at the moment. White wine trends, what's happening with white wine? Well, as you can see, Sauvignon Blanc, which is the second line down there, is representing 43.2% of the market. You could say half the white wine at the moment is Sauvignon Blanc, which is absolutely amazing. Yes, it is declining, but you could probably expect that. It's declining at 1.3% year on year. But a lot of that is driven by the, uh, the New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs, which as we all know over the past few years are absolutely huge and declining a little bit at the moment, but will certainly be part of that. So there's not too many clubs around, not too many venues that don't have Sauvignon Blanc. The thing to highlight here with these statistics is what's happening in the future. What are people trending towards? What are people looking for? And you'll see there Pinot Gris, Pinot Grigio are two things. Reason why? Growing at 15 and 12 and a half percent respectively. So that's really, really big growth. What's the difference between Pinot Gris, Pinot Grigio, everyone asks me all the time? Well, nothing really. They're the same grape varietal. The fact is that uh, Grigio, which is left on the vine a little bit longer, gets a bit more sugar, is a little bit more fruit flavour to it, which is more of an Italian style. 
the grey is uh, it's it's picked a little bit early before there's too much sugar on there, so it's a little bit of a dry style. But if you're not exploring grey and grigio on your wine lists, your consumers are looking for it, your members are looking for it, so it's something you should be looking at. How can we help you? Well. Labo M. Everyone knows Labo M. Labo M has been a huge brand for us in New South Wales and a huge brand for us nationally over the last few years. As you can see there, in excess of 400,000 bottles have been sold in the last 12 months. Great thing about this brand is that we're very much about looking after the integrity and the value of the brand. In other words, you won't see it advertised in off-premise retail. You won't see the big chains doing lots of advertising with it. We're very protective to make sure that all the channels within in our industry, whether that be online, off-premise, on-premise, everyone can make their margins out of this product. So you'll never see it advertised out there. You'll never see anyone doing the wrong thing by the, by the brand, hence, why it can work in all three segments of the market. I just have to go back here. Sorry guys, but this is jumping ahead for some unknown reason. Okay, red wine, what's happening with red wine? Okay, well, as you can see, Shiraz, 34.4% of the category and growing at 2.8% year on year, which is which is very, very big growth for a, for a product and a, and a style that's got that uh, percentage of the market. Cabernet, basically half of Shiraz at 16.7, growing at 3.3. Pinot, which is, uh, which is making some big inroads of late, is at 11% uh, of, the, of the category, growing at 12.9. And rosé, which uh, a lot of people refer to as a girly drink, rosé at 8.9% of the category, which has made huge inroads over the last few years. A number of years ago, you wouldn't have seen that anywhere on this slide or very little on this slide, uh, growing at 18.8. Interestingly, down the bottom, Grenache. Yes, it's only 1.2% of the market, but it's growing at 36.1%, which is, which is enormous growth. Okay, how can we help you guys here? As we said, rosé growing at 19%, rosé, rosé itself growing at 29% year on year. As you can see, it's got a little bit of bling there as well. It's won awards for the packaging. As you can see, it looks pretty schmick. It's won awards for the capsule, uh, one that uh, over in Europe, it's, it's uh, one of a kind, the capsule, and you'll see the indent on the bottle as well. So everything about presentation looks fantastic. As you know, there's a bit of conception about rosé. Most people think it's a great variety. It's not, it's just a, it's just a, a style of wine. Um, you often will find that if you, squeeze a, if you squeeze a white grape, you'll get white juice. If you squeeze a red grape, you'll get white juice as well. What happens is that during that um, process, the, um, the process, it's about getting the color which comes from the skin. So when you hear winemakers talk about days on skins, that's where the color is coming from. So with rosé, there's a little bit of skin contact to get that nice salmony color to it. And there's lots of different styles. So there's Cabernet, there's Pinot rosé, there's Grenache rosé, there's Nebbiolo rosé. And um, this particular one is a Sangiovese rosé. So it's very dry, it's very drinkable. And, and it's, it's certainly the, the, the goods at the moment. And as I said, growing significantly year on year. Pinot, Pinot Noir, as we said, was growing significantly well, making great inroads to it. This particular one, which forms part of the La Boheme range, we have only just released it. So we don't have too many statistics on this. It is a perfect drink at this time of year and a perfect drink coming into to spring as well. It's lighter in style than, than uh, other reds. A little bit lighter in alcohol, which is fantastic. This particular one's only about 13%. So uh, you can have a couple of bottles, so to speak, and still walk to bed, which is a great for everyone. Uh, the other thing too, is it really, it's a really food friendly wine. So anything that's light, anti-pasto, uh, light meats, duck, just beautiful. It's a great food pairing wine. So if, there's no, if you guys don't have anything on your list out there, you need to get Pinot on your list. You've seen what the inroads that it is making of late. 
Woodfire, this is, this is what we talk about, the big and bold. This is uh, a range that we've had out for a number of years, growing significantly at about 26%, which is great growth. Comes from a region in Victoria called Heathcote, which has really different styles of soil. So it produces these big, black, plump berry flavours. And you get, uh, it, it, it's part of that big game meat style. So if you're after, if you, if you love your steak, anything big and bold, this is quite the style to have. If the traditional Barossa styles that you've been used to over years and years and years, this is that, but even more. It's got different styles, different flavours coming out of it. Yes, it is a little bit more in uh, in alcohol, getting up pretty close to that 15%. So um, if you have a couple of bottles of this, uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, you are sleeping the night on the couch, so to speak. One thing I just wanted to show you here, and for some unknown reason, this is just jumping the gun slightly here. This is Grenache Wizardry. So this has just been released in the last few days. So the wizardry comes about because it's it's Grenache and what you can do with the with the style of one particular grape variety. So that in itself being Grenache. We've got the Grenache, which is the traditional red grape. As I said, skin contact, you get a rosé out of that. And then we've also got the Grenache Blanc, which is a really different style. There's only a couple of Grenache Blancs in Australia. As you can see, it's all about appeal. It's, 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 very, it's a very sexy label. The juice itself is, is beautiful. All three styles are, are, are obviously completely different, but it's amazing. Grenache Blanc, if you went into to anywhere at the moment and asked for a Grenache Blanc, you wouldn't see too much of it around. There's very few styles like that at the moment but they're talking about the next wave, the next wave of wines that we're gonna see in, in the next couple of years to come. And Grenache and Tempranillo are a couple of those. And this is our, our sort of foothold and our, our footprint, so to speak, into uh, what you can do with one particular grape variety. So I think as you, uh, as you uh, over the next couple of months, you'll probably see lots and lots of discussions about um, Grenache. You'll probably see lots of write-ups. The, uh, the wine writers love the style, they love the grape variety. So Opportunity, absolutely opportunity is abound at the moment. As I said, just wanted early on, I just want to talk to you about some single serve options, which are probably more relevant than ever at the moment. It's all, you know, obviously our sanitary requirements that we need to go through on a daily basis. Single serve options are the perfect options to, uh, to overcome some of those issues that we're facing at the moment. This particular styles that we've got, we cover all the bases at the moment. So you've got your Prosecco, you've got Rosé, you've got different sparklings, you've got Pinot Gris, you've got Chardonnay, you've got Shiraz Cabernet and, and Tempranillo. During COVID, when it was in its, in its worst period and those restaurants that did remain open and were able to, to do takeaways, as you would have known, the, license, the liquor license changed where they could actually give takeaway. It was amazing how many people did the, the, the meal with this single serve option. It went through the roofs. In fact, we couldn't keep up at, at times with production. So I think as we move forward, there's gonna be a lot more calls to make sure that uh, this single serve option is there. If you don't have it at the moment, please speak to your local representatives. It's something that I think your patrons will be after more and more down the track. On-premise options. Obviously at the moment, we're all about margin. The wonderful thing about exclusive on-premise that you don't have any of your, your customers or your members coming up saying, hey, I can buy that particular product down the road. These are only in on-premise. The margins to be made absolutely is totally up to what obviously your margin requirements are. As you can see, that's that's the rough pricing of it. You know, you can get it up to, you can see it listed in certain clubs at $12. You have it at other clubs at 29. I've even seen it at five star hotels at 39.99. The juice is fantastic. We've never had anyone complain about the product. The other great thing about that brand, you'll see that the sparkling comes in a screw cap. There's not too many with screw caps. So therefore your wastage is not there. You can open it now, screw, it, screw the, the, the cap back on, put it in the fridge, pull it out and that sparkling this time tomorrow will be just as fantastic. Second tier option, a little bit different, a little bit more in pricing, but that's straight for idols as opposed to the Willow Glen. 
This in itself, fantastic, fantastic range, gives you the margin opportunities. That in itself gives you a screw cap option as well. So as I said, wastage. We all love screw cap because there isn't the wastage. There's always wastage when you talk about sparkling wines and you've got a cork. Wonderful thing about these particular brands is that there's no wastage in that particular instance. And the last on-premise option is Lorimer. This is a third tier package. So if you happen to have a club that does lots of functions, um, you've got an auditorium where you're doing lots of weddings, we sell a lot of this for those particular functions. Obviously wedding parties, when they leave the wedding party, they go down to the club, they go into the restaurant, um, the, the bar and or the coffee shop and they get a glass of wine. The last thing they wanna see is the wine behind the bar is what they're drinking upstairs. So this is a perfect option and it's been very popular since we introduced it over the last few years. Point of sale options for you guys. Obviously, I know and understand that um, you guys do quite a few things on in-house, but please speak to your local representative about our point of sale options that we have. We've got wine lists, we've got table tents, we've got wine of, wine of the month opportunities there. All the, all the options we've got, yes, they obviously will be laminated moving forward. So, um, you know, we'll make sure that we get around and make sure that, that it's hygienic for the clubs. If there's anything you need when it comes to POS options, please have a chat to your, um, to your local representatives. There is certainly options there. And I know a lot of the clubs these days are doing digital marketing as well. So if you need anything produced, please have a chat to, the, to your local representative. Uh, only a phone call away and it will take only a couple of, couple of minutes to get the, uh, the ad organised for you. But probably my last point that I'd just like to, to leave with you guys too is, is about the education of, of, of your frontline staff. It's really important from where I stand and I know from, um, from Lion and also from Coke as well, it's really important that, that, that the frontline staff are really well educated. So please get on to the, to the beverage representatives and make sure that um, they are educating your staff. Product knowledge is absolutely paramount at the moment and there's nothing worse than having staff in, in, in frontline positions that don't know what they're selling and can't recommend you anything. You know, yes, you may have to spend some time. Yes, you may have to spend some money on educating your staff. Yes, they might leave and take that education with them. But if they don't leave and they, and they stay, then you've got an, an uneducated staff. So I, I can't stress to you guys enough, number one staff, number one customer at the moment is your staff. So, um, so please look after them. Thanks, Gary. Thank you very much, Warwick. You managed to make me quite thirsty when you were describing all of those wines. Um, I think I've been responsible for half the, the sales increase in rosés in the last few months. I, I particularly like your La Boheme rosé. I think I've told you that before. Anyway, yeah, thank you for, for that very good and very detailed presentation, Warwick. And now moving on to our third beverage representative, which is uh, Coca-Cola Amatil. And Craig Weeks is his, the on-premise uh, state manager for Coca-Cola Amatil. So welcome, Craig. Well, thank you very much, Gary, and a, a very good afternoon to everyone online this afternoon. Um, as Gary said, yeah, uh, Craig Weeks is my name. I look after the on-premise channel uh, for New South Wales for, for CCA. So a big channel coming many thousand uh, accounts across New South Wales. Um, what I want to touch on today uh, is very, very topical. A um, couple of three main subjects, restarting your post-mix systems, uh, a little bit different to Julian uh, and, and the Lion side of things with beer systems. Um, see, the Coke systems do work a little bit differently, so we'll go through that. Um, Maximising sales and profitability, in particular in your food and dining areas. Uh, that's the main area of influence when it comes to soft drinks and how to maximise your sales will cover off as well. And engaging with uh, what I'm calling the new COVID consumer. Now, I'm not sure if it's a trending term or not, but I'm calling it a COVID consumer and how we engage with them um, going forward as well. So first up, uh, the post-mix systems, no matter if you're a Asahi or CCA customer, the equipment is much the same. So you've got your chiller units all the way through to your bar guns or towers, depending what you use. Uh, obviously connected up to gas, water, electricity, and, and so on and so forth. The main thing here is that um, these systems were uh, very much designed to be on 24-7, uh, 365 days a year, not really designed to be turned off and especially off and on. So what we have uh, actually found through the COVID period, and especially very early on in the process, is that 80% of venues did shut those post systems down. 
It caught us a bit unawares. Uh, the speed, if you recall, of all this happening back in March this year was off the chart. Um, and before we knew it, the doors had closed on venues and uh, the post mix systems had all been left behind and shut. So the reality of that being that the, um, the lines, the Python lines, all the way through to your guns was full of syrup and water and it stayed that way for about three odd months until, until now. So the condition of that product in those lines, obviously not uh, very good at all. The equipment in most cases was also left in uh, much the same condition. It was uh, left back in March as well. So restarting yourselves and getting back to a nice safe uh, environment and having a high quality product is uh, reasonably easy to follow. The machines, if you um, have, have switched those off, which as we said before, 80% of customers did do that, um, you need to book in a restart. Talk to your local rep or your account manager uh, and they'll be able to help organize the restart of that equipment. We ask that you actually, believe it or not, don't start your machines yourself. It is a little complicated. There are a few little procedures you need to follow and you need to get them in the right order. Um, if you do it yourself, there is actually a high risk of major damage to your equipment, which we would like to avoid. Uh, and it'll get you sped up uh, in the process of getting restarted as well. Um, if your equipment has been shut down for even as little as 30 days, um, there's actually a strong likelihood of buildup of bacteria uh, and other contaminants in your lines. We don't want you drinking that. That's the last thing I'd want to drink at the moment, especially after the pain you and your venues have gone through over the last three or four months. Um, so get it done, obviously, the right way. There's a list there of, uh, of the key things that your technicians will be covering as they come around to, to your venues, uh, including actually just the replacement of your water filters. Um, believe it or not, that will make a massive difference, even just the replacement of those water filters uh, in venue. Uh, it'll take around about two to four hours, um, depending on size of the venue. Some of the big, big RSL clubs uh, will take a full day uh, to do, but uh, your average club around about two to four hours. Maximising sales. So once we're up and going, how do we make the most out of our dining and food areas? We're all after that. Um, the reality is we're in a, a reduced capacity environment at the moment. Um, that will stay that way for quite some time. So we just need to obviously work our ways to maximise those sales for customers we do have and members we do have in our club. Uh, a bit of perspective, the average club sells around 50,000 serves throughout the course of a year. Uh, and the big clubs uh, can range from in that 300 to 400,000 serve uh, environment throughout the course of a year, obviously non-COVID periods. Now, I want you to, I guess, have a bit of a think. What would the average rate of incidence be in your venue? Um, if you have a think of a, of a table, if, it's a, if there's four people at a table, for instance, and they've all got a meal, they've bought a meal at your club, how many out of that four have actually purchased a drink, and I'm not saying soft drink, it could be a beer, wine, anything uh, you like. How many have bought a soft drink and what's the rate of incidence there? Uh, it'll actually surprise you. In clubs, it sits at around about 55%. Um, now, most people online will probably scratch their heads and think that doesn't apply to my venue. In fact, it does. Those numbers will obviously change depending on your venue, but it's give or take around about that number. Now, there are two main driving factors for that. Um, we try, try to think of the, the main benchmark, if you like, in the industry, in the food and service industry anyway, as being McDonald's and, and Hungry Jack's. Now, they are nothing like a club, but they actually set the benchmark in the food and bev side of things. Their rate of incidence is around about 95%. So the vast majority of people who have a meal in those venues do get a drink. In a club, We've got an evil thing called tap water. Um, it's a necessity, you have to have it. It's a legal requirement, but we make it very, very easy for our, our members to get a tap uh, service. Uh, it's sitting on the front of the bar. We even put ice wells there to make it even easier too. So uh, it is a watch out and it does go on a lot of tables throughout your bistros, uh, throughout your, your venue. Research has actually shown us that if you do have a meal combo, um, and, and I don't mean to liken this to a takeaway environment, it's not, where you pair a drink. So whether they, again, that be a beer, uh, a wine, soft drink, we obviously like it to be a soft drink, but in the end of the day, we're trying to drive your beverage sales. Uh, if you do have a combo of any kind, uh, a pairing, so drink and steak, drink and schnitzel, whatever it might be, you'll see a 25% increase in your sales of beverages throughout the club. Uh, another interesting stat is that 65% of shoppers actually say a meal deal activated on your menus 
helps them choose what to water. Now, the reason for putting that stat in is to actually show you that people can be steered and people are steered by what you actually put on uh, your menus and what you have on your digital screens in venues as well. Uh, if I go on a bit of a tangent, and for those who've got Netflix, and there's a lot of you that do, 75% um, of the content that is watched on Netflix is actually recommended by Netflix. So you're actually, again, steered by what they're recommending to you. So uh, going back to the original point, 25% increase in beverages. If you have ways and mechanisms to actually steer your customer into meal deals. It is the biggest area of, of opportunity really for you uh, at the moment, especially when you've got reduced uh, numbers in your venues. You can see some examples there, and I've even put Julian, I put a two is new down the bottom right for you, just to make you happy. But the, um, there are different ways and means, and whether that's a, a pizza and a jug or a beer and steak, you name it, there are different ways and, and shapes to be able to do this. By way of steering someone, if I'm walking into your venue with my family, I may have had no prior disposition to wanting to buy a pizza. However, I've seen there that there's a cracking pizza and jug offer on at the moment for 20 bucks. Um, let's buy into that. I've all of a sudden I've bought a pizza and a jug. So um, if you haven't got something in place, please consider it. CCA have got a market, uh, so have got a, um, a huge publishing department behind us. We can help you. You can provide photos to us or we can do it all for you. But uh, talk to you like a representative or drop me a line after this as well. Other things to consider outside of food could be something similar to this. Uh, have a think about your cafe. Are you pairing a cold drink with your hot drink? In most cases, most venues don't do it, but there's actually a way that staff can help drive that for you and, uh, and help uh, increase that basket size. So instead of a $4 coffee, all of a sudden you've got a $6 purchase going through by adding a water on as well. Could be a sparkling water, could be anything. Staff can also have fun with a, an offer like this, $1 soft drinks with every main meal, could it be $2, um, forget the dollar, the, um, the amount there, just concentrate on the, the style of promotion. There are different ways that you can do these promotions. Not many uh, clubs are doing sushi promotions, but these are idea starters for you. Um, salads, um, there you go, Gary, you and I can have a salad and a Mount Franklin sparkling next time we're in a club. But look, the, the health conscious consumer is looking for new ways to eat and drink. Um, suggestive selling and steering your customer is uh, definitely the way forward. And lastly, for me, last subject is engaging with this um, COVID consumer, I'm calling it. So I'm not here to say this is the way to do things. I'm probably going to more to talk to the, the, the trends and what we're seeing at the moment. So the current state of play during COVID, I must say it was really pleasing to see the acceleration in clubs and what they were doing during that COVID shutdown to engage with consumers via social media. Um, you've done an amazing job. Um, some people have started from a standing start, others have already had something established and they've built on it. Um, so as a general statement, the current state of play is very basic. There are some clubs doing this very well though. Uh, over the next six months, we are seeing or we look to see a big increase in investment behind social media, uh, Facebook and Instagram, that will continue to grow. Um, how do you invest? How do you bring partners like us and, and your wine and beer supplies along with you? We can help invest with, uh, with help of uh, obviously promotional funding as well. Um, uh, as what Julian said before too, big brands are also a big part of this too. People are engaging more and more with the big brands in market. Trading our way out of COVID, um, one interesting thing to consider here is that most clubs do have a peak period or a couple of peak periods throughout the week. Uh, a Friday, Saturday night is generally the main. We're seeing going forward that this will probably spread out or there'll be a need for you to spread this out across the seven days of your, your work week. Um, that'll be driven a lot by the consumer as, as what Julian was showing before too with the fact that you've got 1.5 meter, 1 meter distancing, those queues are gonna be astronomical if there's not a way of managing this. Um, some of your members will do it for you. They'll start arriving at different times to try and get around it because they won't enjoy a long queue either. Um, but different days of the week needs to be a consideration. How do you get people out of your Friday, Saturday nights into other days uh, of the week? Um, rebuilding confidence obviously is a big thing, uh, getting people back into venues. Aggregators, if you don't know that term, that's um, in reference to say Uber Eats um, uh, and uh, Deliveroo, those sort of companies. Clubs are historically very slow to adapt this sort of technology. Um, it is something that we have been surprised by the, the degree of adoption of this, in particular uh, CBD venues. Not only hotels, but high profile restaurants have all gone down this path and they're all actually feeding back to us that post COVID, they are actually gonna keep on this path because they've made such big inroads and they've made such extra um, money or extra profit lines out of going down this path that they're, they're actually gonna continue with it. 
Domestic tourism is going to explode. We, um, the international market is basically shut down for the moment and will be very tough to get back up and going. So overnight stays, long weekends, how are you engaging with people across the state or interstate to bring them into your club? Um, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. And contactless ordering, which flows into my next slide here, is, uh, is going to continue to grow. Uh, this is my last slide. There's a couple of interesting stats. Don't get caught up in the full writing here. Uh, it is reasonably similar, but also different to Julian's stats before too. The, um, the studies that have been done recently by a mob called Me and You show that 65% of customers have got a preference now to look at digital menus in the way they order. There's around about 60% of people um, that are wary of standing in queues. Now, this study was done across uh, takeaway in, in all sorts of environments, including on-premise, so that's why it's a little bit different to Julian's stat, but it's a very high percentage nonetheless. And 95% of uh, people want to pay on card these days or via a mobile device. So put all that together, you can see this contactless future, whether you like it or not, and whether you're an adopter of it just yet or not, it will be the way forward. Some venues, as you can see down the bottom left there, Wenty Leagues, for instance, um, are now using mobile devices. You can uh, scan a QR code and you can do all your ordering now on a mobile device. So uh, venues are now doing it. It'll be a slow process, I'm sure, but CCA do have a partner called Tab Square uh, that we engage with. We've got a few other partners as well too, and most of these partners we have are non-commission based as well, which is really important. Um, the likes of Deliveroo and Uber Eats are extremely expensive to partner with. Uh, we've got some partners we can talk to you about. Um, just engage with either myself or your local account manager and we can talk to you about uh, that as well. But interesting times ahead, Gary. Um, I thank you very, very much for uh, allowing me the time this afternoon. And uh, for everyone online, I wish you a good afternoon and look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks very much, Craig. Again, a, a very comprehensive and informative presentation. Very much appreciated. And our final presenter, isn't uh, selling a particular product. What he wants to do is make sure the product that you do serve comes to you to your patrons in a beautiful, fresh and tasty way. So it's my pleasure to introduce Carl, Carl Pavitt from Hunter Technologies. Uh, Carl's brain in, in the uh, clubs is usually seller control, but I'll leave Carl to out outline his product and services. Yeah, thanks, Gareth, and uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. I know everyone's very busy in this strange new world trying to get venues back up to the way they were. Um, but, yeah, we're primarily a technology-based business that um, do a range of different technologies, ranging from our, our, our systems such as seller control to also airborne sanitisation systems, which um, help, help treat in different areas. But primarily, I think most of you will know us by a yeah, seller control technology, which goes on to your, your beer lines. Um, sorry, I just... It's not going down for me. Okay, so one thing which we all know, which we've already been come across, is the increased requirements. Um, that is from every single part of your venue, from the, as soon as they walk in the front door to every part of front of house and every part of back of house, there is some major um, cleaning processes now that we all have to consider. And one of the ones which we're obviously very involved in is your beer line systems. Um, seller control is a, a system that goes on there. So that's where all of our um, background is, um, basically helping venues maintain the, the, the correct uh, requirements to clean, the correct processes and making sure that the products are coming out the way they should be, as well as a safety issue. Um, we, we partner with some very good chemical companies and some very good um, options to make sure that the, the patrons are, um, or you, sorry, your, your staff are safe and you, you've got the best possible practice, which we call the full system approach. One of the things we've found in the last 15 years is that a lot of people actually don't know why they're cleaning a beer line. Um, a lot of people know they get growth in there. They know they've got to have, for some reason, they've got to clean the beer lines because if not, it will affect the product, um, which is obviously a very important part of every venue. Um, but one of the major contributing facts is a product called Biofilm. And the slide I've just put up there now is just showing um, how inside a beer line it changes over time. So on a typical venue on across any beer, you've got the first stage of biofilm growth, which is the yeast being attached to the, to the inside of the beer line. 
then they get that yellowy growth, which is the biofilm which grows around the outside of it. As that biofilm grows, it allows more yeast to, yeast to attach, which allows um, more to grow, you know, your bacteria, and after that one to two week mark on a normal beer line, it will start releasing back into the beer line and start affecting the taste. And that's where the counts will get too high and you've got to do it. So your typical process is you come through and clean that out. Um, our technology, the cellar control actually does remove that biofilm. So it slows down the processes um, of that biofilm. So without that biofilm, it's very different yeast to attach. So the venue can do a lot longer period between cleaning, but without that, you're looking at a one to two week clean. And one of the things which we want to push, and this is for venues that are using our gear or not, is that creating a clean system from the top to the, the, the bottom of the system to the top of the taps is an extremely important part. With, as everyone's been discussing now with all the different beverages, GDP is a huge thing. We've got to make sure that we're turning profits over um, by making sure the product is being served correctly. So that's one thing which we... So we supply a guide and checklist out to all our customers on all these different components, but you need to be doing every part of that system on a regular basis. So with every keg change, you should be cleaning the couplers with an antibacterial spray. Every week, all the tap heads should be cleaned, all the bar drains should be cleaned, all those sort of things. Um, every three to four weeks, changing over the transfer leads, making sure they're either swapped to new ones or you've got, um, or you clean the existing ones to, to reuse and obviously comp completing the line clean, um, which with all the, the background we've done with testing, one to two weeks, you'll start getting very high counts, or if you've got a prohibiting device such as cellar control, you can be cleaning every six to eight weeks with the same process. Um, and that's one of the biggest things is, I think with going forward, all best practice now needs to not just take into consideration what may have been done in the past, we're all now worried about cleaning, We've got to make sure that wastage is a very important thing to make sure we've got those profits coming through. And obviously you need to make sure that you're, all the ongoing checks and maintenances, um, that you are maintaining every part of that system and there's no issues anywhere through it. Um, we also recommend the enzymatic cleaners um, now. The enzymatic cleaners are such as uh, Maxi Enzyme, which is a product which we can supply through our channels, are uh, safe, um, cleaners that will do a very effective job um, while making sure there is no risk at all to any of your staff while they're cleaning the beer lines. All this is on our big beer guide, which you can easily download across on the website. Um, yeah, it's a sellercontrol.com.au. Um, one of the other products that we also do, we're not just involved with the seller control, we're also now um, pushing a product which we've been involved with since about 2015 called the OHA. And it's a airborne in, um, in surface treatment system. And one thing to which all components of the beer system and the bar, you need to be looking at ways to keeping it safe for your staff. Because as much as we've got a lot of people trying to get back into the venues, we've also got staff now which are going to be taking time off for anything, whether it's a flu, whether it's a cold, and that is part of the new normal. So our technology is there to be treating the entire bar area to making sure that your staff are safe um, and there's less transmission um, across there. And this does go across all the other processes too. You need to be cleaning them down, tap heads need to be cleaned down the surfaces, cleaning everything down to make sure that they are all staying safe. So basically reduces your costs and also reduces um, the need to try to find more staff to, to cover, cover sick leave. Um, Part of all that obviously is procedures, which we're all being flooded with now. Um, and that's something that, again, the system by having it there to promote to the customers, this is another documented way that you're out there doing everything you can to make sure that the system, the venue is safe and that it's looked after. Um, so that's the hydroxyl technology. Um, that's the, the, ma the main system that we are pushing for the cleanliness of the bar at the moment. Um, and what it uses is what they call a hydroxyl, um, which is just a natural uh, process, a get process to make sure that the, the venue is clean. Uh, it works 24 hours a day, it's totally safe and can be installed in any indoor space. Um, we're also promoting with that a Zuno, which is just a, a product, which is microbiral spray, which you can spray over the entire bar. It will last for 30 days, it's non-toxic and will also help transfer 
lower transmission rates between staff and patrons. Um, by doing all this, you're showing that you're basically doing everything that's possible, making sure that the, that the patrons feel safe and they're, they're happy to be in there. And that's, that's it. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much, Carl. Um, I'll just put my slides back up. And as I promised you, there are the contact details of our four presenters that have been here uh, presenting for you today. Julian Black from Lyon, uh, Warwick Brook from Debortley Wines, Craig Weeks from Coca-Cola Amatil, and Carl Pavitt from Hunter Technologies. Um, we, uh, so I'll let, put that back in a moment, but uh, next week, in two weeks time, our next uh, Evolve webinar program is called Patron Safety, Security and Cleanliness Procedures. Uh, and we'll send you out more details of the presenters and the topics that they'll be speaking on via uh, email in the next couple of weeks. But if you have any questions for any of our presenters today, there are their email addresses and their mobile phone numbers. I'm sure they'll be very happy to receive uh, an inquiry from you. And should you want any of those presentations, just email me or email the presenter directly and uh, I'm sure they'll be happy to forward their, their PowerPoint presentation to you. But uh, thank you very much to Julian, Warwick, Craig and Carl for your presentations and very informative information today. It's very much appreciated. And thank you to everyone for your participation. And I look forward to welcoming you again in two weeks time. Thank you.